Uh, a question that uh, I have gotten a number of times is, um, uh, will, this, uh, will this be recorded and will it be available? I sure hope so, because we've all been staring into that light <laughs> for no reason at all, <laughs> if it's not going to be. Uh, no, it will be on the Athenaeum's YouTube channel uh, probably uh, within about three weeks, and of course we'll be sharing that link with uh, HABS and, and APT and whoever else uh, would, would like to have it. So, uh, so yes, it, it, it will, uh, will be there. Uh, and um, we, um, when it goes live, we will uh, email all of the, the registrants so that you know to look for it. So, um, very well. So this uh, this afternoon's panel, we have a uh, a couple of uh, questions, uh, and of course the universal question is where did Bruce put the glasses? I, I need to get. You know what? You know what would be a great party gift for me? A lanyard. <laughs> so, are they? Um, this question lost, is for um, Mario. Uh, given that there are so many uses for documentation, from creating a record to conservation, uh, um, I guess George, I don't know. Uh, are there key components which we should all strive to include, and is it impossible to anticipate? all the potential uses. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> that's a tricky question because obviously when we start a documentation project, we always ask the client what's the purpose of the data. And obviously, I remember a few years ago we were contacted to do the recording of a church that was to be adaptive reuse into something different. And I asked what kind of a scale, graphic scale, do you require the measure drawings to be? And the person said one to one. I said, oh, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, because I'm going to charge you for one year processing time, right? <laughs> With two or three students, we're going to make money. So basically, when I said that, they said, no, actually, we, we, we consulted with the city hall, and we need one to 50. So I said, yes. OK, so there we can make a budget. So obviously, the data capturing, as Paul was saying, is something that we try to collect as much data as we can. And obviously, that data can be used for different purposes. But obviously, the scope of work is always very, very defined. And in some cases, we might have to recur to go back and do more work. But in the past, I think that, uh, that the scope was really driven the amount of data that was collected. And nowadays, we collect more than, than, than we need in, in many cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this one for, uh, for Willie. Given all of the individuals involved in uh, HABS recording over the years, do you have any recommendation on how HABS can tap into that uh, work for the benefit of the collection? Well, I think. Um, the staff right now is doing a great job of scanning a lot of the material from there. Most of it's from this outbuilding recording project that we worked on. It's, it includes more than just outbuildings, but uh, that's the vast majority of it, and I think that's a big part of the effort. Um, and I don't know, it'd be good down the road to, uh, for HAPS to continue that relationship and potentially scan the churches and theaters and houses and everything else that was worked on. It'd also be great to do all the early stuff that's in there. But there's, I think there may have been 50 or 60,000 drawings at Williamsburg when I started. Uh, and we may have added another 15, 20,000 to it. So no problem. It's, uh, <laughs> it will be a life. Uh, Just drop them off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this question is for Paul. Uh, Nobody ever speaks about the different approaches a team would take if photo only versus scan only versus photo plus scans. Do you make changes in the recording project? So are we talking photogrammetry and laser scan only, or are we talking photo project, like Habs photos? Is the that, that would have to be the, whoever asked that question would have to, <laughs> have to fill Different. that in. I mean, we definitely uh, don't bring to bear every piece of technology on every site that we're doing. So um, like a piece of sculpture would only usually require photogrammetry. Uh, the, they're really, the, the approach is pretty much the same, is trying to get as much coverage as we can, as much information as we can on that. 
Some, and then, you know, I said we do a lot of hand measuring, but there are sites that we can capture with just the digital workflow. And um, a lot of those obviously aren't complex structures. I don't, I'm not sure if that answers the question, mm -hmm. but. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, this one um, is for, uh, for Willie. Uh, can you explain uh, uh, how um, Carson changed the conventions of HABS documentation and why? Um, well, I, he had spent a lot of time in England and he was working with archaeologists who spent more time looking at standing buildings than archaeologists tend to do here. And they had developed their own sort of conventions for um, showing periods of construction and he was trying to push the Brits at the time to think more broadly about how you can graphically explain buildings than what they were doing even. But he brought, when he, and he was working in um, New England for a while with Abbott Cummings um, very early in his career. And, uh, you know, they were thinking a lot about the development of buildings there. So when he went to St. Mary City and started looking at these buildings in Maryland, I think he was trying to pull together the work he had done in England and the work he was, a little bit of the work he was doing in New England mm -hmm. to create these new graphic standards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'll open this one up to, to all of you. Let's see. How can a public citizen honor and protect a residential property documented by deed uh, before the year 1800 located on the bank of a New Jersey river <laughs> where arrowheads and a Mexican peso of silver dated 1776 was found under the un, unaged timber flooring. You got this. <laughs> this is all of you. You got this. Yes, we've that made, <laughs> we've made broad knowledge of uh, legal <laughs> frameworks in the US. <laughs> Let's move the house to Canada. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, yes. I don't know if I can answer that, but one way, yes, maybe you guys can answer that. Um, yeah, laser scanning. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know, I lost track of what the question was there. Um, no, I, I think it's, it's basically findings is something valuable that was found in this house, and the house is not protected, right? Is that the question? I'll, I'll, I didn't write the question, so I... Somebody's not I'll, I'll let, this. I would say... Oh, there, there we are. <laughs> okay. The Go ahead, Gene. <laughs> the structure exists. The structure yeah. exists. <laughs> and it's likely to be sold and torn down because it's a very valuable piece of property on the river in New hmm. Jersey. And we're trying to think about a way to save at least that fragment of the earliest construction. On site or moving it? It's, it's been documented by Ocean County, but that's it. Uh -huh. No preservation ordinance stop. Well, I mean, that's tough. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's what America is like, is that, you know. <laughs> If you're not going to use federal dollars on it, you know, it, a lot of times it really is. Um, so we have to come to Mr. Rockefeller. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mr. Rockefeller really isn't uh, the answer to me. He, you know, it just isn't. So you just, you've got to get local support for it, and um, you know, there's got to be enough local outrage to, uh, yeah. you know, hold it at bay. It's the, the lack of um, indigenous support in that community and area that is, you know, everybody in the Philadelphia area, you know, still honoring, has now begun to honor the fact that an entity exists on the United Right. So, you know, where do you think about that in New Jersey, at least in that? If, if, if I could put Mario on the spot, if, if, if a similar situation occurred in another country where you have worked, um, uh, how might that be approached? Well, I mean, obviously you cannot go against the laws of a country, right? And 
as I said, you know, we need to recognize that that property is valuable and there should be some kind of level of protection. In this case, there is nothing. So obviously it depends. And the site custodian is reluctant to, to protect the house. So it's, a, it's a difficult case. Now you can shame the site custodian, the, the owner of the property, and you should do that. Mm -hmm. Honestly, that's, that's the way. You have to shame them somehow in the news, etc. And then you can contact you know, different organizations. I mean, in ICOMOS, we have something called the Heritage at Risk. Uh, and the heritage at risk are always triggered by the national committees. In this case, it's the United States ICOMOS National Committee. And they can issue a heritage at risk alert to say that there is a property in New Jersey that is in danger because the owner doesn't want, and we have done it many times. Now, is that going to change the fact that it's going to be destroyed? No, but uh, it might. We have been able to save some places like that with some kind of international pressure. But obviously, there, there is other organizations, uh, you know, non-for-profit organizations in the U.S. that will be perf perf so perfectly. Exactly. I would say that these kind of instruments are. Yes, exactly. These kind of instruments will be good, but you have to make a. You have to reach out to them, and make the case. But I think that's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I suppose uh, you could send them a, a, cop, a link to this YouTube uh, of this uh, <laughs> of this session. So. Yeah. Uh, well, th uh, thank you very much. Uh, don't go anywhere, gentlemen. Uh, but I would like to call uh, our mornings uh, our mornings uh, uh, speakers and last night's speaker uh, up for um, uh, for uh, a full panel, but. Uh, also, I'd like to call Catherine Lavoie to do not quite closing remarks. <laughs> okay, you're going to have to bear with me a bit as I go over my copious notes here from today to try to. I figured it might be better to sort of summarize first so we can sort of frame the questions for our panel and for the audience, you know, about today. So first of all, I want to thank our speakers. You all did an amazing job. I'm, I'm really pleased with the way everything's turned out. And thank you all for, for coming here. So um, yes, we've, we've heard a lot uh, today. So we heard about the role of HABs within the context of the national preservation movement in its heyday. And it's really its importance as the first federal Preservation Agency. I mean, I thought about that in terms of the 30s, but really into the 40s and 50s before the National Preservation Act. We can imagine a time before the National Register when HABS really was going out and doing some of the things that the Register were like, you know, creating those listings and creating documentation for public benefit. Uh, we also learned about the, uh, the importance of, um, of the documentation and, and teaching the students, both, well, really both as users and producers, and I really love that uh, the idea that Amalia put out there about them giving back to their community um, and to us, other people have said, the building itself, as you said, Bruce. So it's, it's, a, it's a give and take, and I think that's really important. Uh, we learned about how the ha documentation can influence design practice and rehabilitation. And very here, um, happy to plea, uh, excuse me, happy to hear that HABS is your first stop in looking for information uh, when you take on a new, a new project. Uh, we also learned about um, HABS and its many influencers, uh, such as Colonial Williamsburg, that have guarded our legacy and uh, set an example for the field. Uh, and we've explored the opportunities and challenges of digital recording from the perspectives of both conservation and documentation. Um, so we've covered a lot of ground, and we've come to understand the importance uh, of HABS, the role that it played in preservation movement, and the lives of, of many professionals um, as a training ground for their future endeavors. Um, however, as we've also heard, HABS was not created in a vacuum, but it was part and parcel of a groundswell of activity. Um, that included many others, uh, such as Colonial Williamsburg. And you know, and that in no way undermines its value, but it makes it all the more exciting, I think. I've talked about HAB's formation as this perfect storm of events that were all swirling around and how we were able to grab that opportunity through the WPA um, to make 
what a lot of people were envisioning actually, actually happened. And I think it certainly made for the success of the collection in that it was designed to meet the needs of a, of a broader field. I mean, when you combine the AIA, the Library of Congress, National Park Service, so it was designed um, to have a lasting value. Um, and while its, its mission remains fairly much the same, the field clearly is, has changed and is constantly changing. Um, so we're impacted both by the reevaluation of what we consider historic, moving past that colonial era to document more modern structures, um, and the development of new technologies. So while the latter has certainly been a boon to the field, it's also you know, enabling greater accuracy and efficiency. It's also created potential problems as we strive to retain unwieldy files in, in various formats, uncertain of their future usability. Uh, we also live in an era where there's like an app for everything. So, you know, will people just be using their cell phones in the future to record buildings? But if that's the case, are, are we missing the point then? Because we're not really engaging. What are we learning if we're, if we're, we're just taking, taking that, that path? Um, so where's the future headed, both for HABs and historic preservation in general? So it's kind of the question we're asking. And I was also thinking about, I asked a similar question for our 75th anniversary. If, if there was, you know, should HABs sort of loosen its standards a little bit so that we can include more documentation, especially of endangered and vernacular architecture where, you know, no one's going to write a check to do the full HABs documentation of that building. So how do we deal with that? And when I suggested, should we lower our standards, there was a resounding no, you know, no. But at the same time, you know, I think the collection in terms of drawings is only, only about 20%, maybe 25% of the sites that are recorded include measured drawings. So it becomes a larger responsibility then. So how do we do that? I mean, one of the goals of the Holland Prize that you know Ford helped, uh, was instrumental in creating was to get professionals involved. We want to make it easy for you guys by one sheet, just one sheet, please, just give us one sheet. Um, and we did the same with the with the short form report to make it a less wieldy. Um, so how do we build the collection? You know, we we've got the Colonial Williamsburg model. Do we go out, but also that creates a lot of work in the office for dealing with that. So um, anyway, I just wanted to sort of talk about some of the challenges, sort of frame the question. So if our, we could maybe start with our presenters, if they have recommendations in the context of their talks or how they you know, have presented, or things we should do or shouldn't do or keep doing or anything. And then maybe if anyone in the audience has any suggestions, we could. You got this I was pretty one. glad to be not Thank on you. stage for those yeah. tricky questions. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. I can do it all. <laughs> okay, we're here. Well, that's not what you should say to me. Yes. <laughs> So advice in HAPS, <laughs> I think that's a very, <laughs> I would say that you don't need to compromise on your standard, right? I, I don't think that that's something that needs to happen because the standard is there for some reason. Uh, and actually, is the lack of standards that actually is really <laughs> alarmingly impacting our field of heritage documentation. So I don't think that that's one point. Obviously, you could make some exceptions, right, to the standard in, in particular cases, and that could be one way of doing it. And obviously, some sites that are in danger, uh, some, as you know, we were talking about the case of the house, and you know, they have no recognition, et cetera, so that, that's a way of uh, perhaps including these exceptions in, in cases that really require some kind of uh, help or assistance. Now, if I would say one thing that I feel strongly is that I don't see HAPS uh, really participating in the international network, and I know it's difficult because uh, there is no federal funding from your government to go abroad, but obviously there is other ways of collaborating, and you know, collaborating in uh, 
pursuing the standard, giving advice to other institutions, etc. I was just talking to someone, is there a Canadian equal to HAPS? There is not, because there is not, as simple as that. But can this be a model that could be, but obviously everybody always asks, so this probably is very expensive, and how you do it, and so on. And it's, it's not really very expensive. It's just a matter of uh, having a data management plan and, a, and you know how to adapt these kind of uh, protocols and develop them and then implement a, a mission. And I, and I think that that comes obviously from the civil society rather than from the government. <clears throat> and, I, and a third thing that obviously the digital data sets that, uh, because I know that HAPS drawings are produced from these, some of these digital data sets, but what happened to the raw data and what happened to the, to the process data? Where do they go? That's been a question for me, perhaps. And there is new ways of you know, collecting the data and keeping it uh, with some metadata. Obviously, you don't need to conserve all your uh, millions of bytes of raw images, but maybe you can conserve a set, right? And this could go into a digital library. So you have the measure drawing, and then you have something that is connected where you can download this other digital data. And there is a lot of digital data repositories out there that are being, like Dataverse is one of the systems that we're using. So I hope I was helpful. <laughs> um, at an ICAM meeting, the International Confederation of Architectural Museums a few years back, for, the, for many years there were very few representatives from Asia. Now there are a lot who come. And there was a group of three people who do this in the Philippines. And they say, we, we, uh, all of our guidelines, we follow the Secretary, American Secretary of Interior's guidelines and the Historic American Building Survey. For, and they, it's a very large, I've had 27 people who do this in the Philippines. <laughs> and they were showing you know, e examples of this. Well, I never knew about that. Uh -huh. I don't know if anyone here knows about uh -huh. that. But if ICOMOS or some, I don't know what would be the proper body to s do a survey of what nations use these standards. And in terms of the standards, the one I think is worth investigation in some form of a symposium or analysis is color. Because we've been talking about it, I mean, what so much of the public in terms of our feedback at the Library of Congress, well, don't you have it in color? And plus, it's <coughs> integral, I mean, especially for 20th century architecture, like a, an enameled service station, yeah. to not have it in color is sort of crazy. I mean, to go through all the trouble of doing it and not take a color image. And, that, and the library said for years, I mean, we can preserve you know, color. We have the cold, the cold storage and things like that. So I think that would be a valuable way to expand the standards, not to um, reduce mm -hmm. them to include color documentation. So I think along those lines, something I've talked to Catherine about a lot over the years, and that is, and I know you all are, at HABS are talking about this internally, but the real need to move to digital photography. You're doing all this other digital stuff, and HABS, I think for good reasons, was slow adopting uh, digital standards, but I think what's happened by not doing that is that HABS has really not been part in the Library of Congress, I take it because of this, have not really been part of the discussion on what standards should be, and they've missed out of the generation of, um, you know, this architectural photography that, uh, you know, the rest of us in the world sort of willy-nilly do our own things, and I think it's sort of time to rein that in a little bit, create standard, create usable standards, uh, we don't need to make them so, uh, um, so tight that you can't get a lot of people contributing to it. Uh, it may be a problem with storage once you do that. Well, yeah, we can store the film. We're not so sure about the digital. Oh. <laughs> so, but it could be, I mean, it could be expanded to digital, but I think it would be long, more difficult to establish the digital standard than one for film. For sure, but, <laughs> um, but the reality is, 90% of 99% yeah. of us out there don't shoot film anymore. Yeah. And um, well, that's it's, it's all in the works. 
I realize oh, that. Okay. I, I think that needs to be. <laughs> it just takes a long time yeah, for that, that stuff to we're, we're anxious for it to come yeah, out I'm, and see what it I is. I know. So. You, he's back there. You make sure you bother him. <laughs> <laughs> he's putting his head down. And I would say <laughs> the other I, thing I, about standards is that, from my standpoint, I just can't see. You, know, you all do such quality work. And I would, I think that that needs to be held up high for everybody to do. But I think the amount of recording that you're willing to take, you know, the, 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 the quantity of recording for a particular building, it seems to me that's where you ought to be flexible. So if you get floor plans of, you know, 50 Adobe houses or something like that, that's probably something that's very meaningful, even though you don't have sections and right. door jams and stuff like that. And I think that's where I would be flexible is in. Um, that piece of the collection. When you see a uh, source of additional <clears throat> collections material might be um, through the SHPOs, like in New York State, if you get a State Historic Preservation Grant, there's a clause in the contract that you're to do measure drawings, HABS standards. Uh, question is, is there contact between those SHPOs and uh, the HABS staff? Architects have to do good measure drawings if they're going to work on buildings. It's just, it's much more practical, much more economical for architects to do good measure drawings. But to go the extra step to do them to H, uh, HABS format and get and coordinate with HABS, uh, they're on to the next project. What's happening to uh, all those drawings that are being done? And even the Park Service, you do work for the National Park Service on a property. Uh, measure drawings have to be done to HABS standards. Are, are, and the Park Service is a many-headed monster. You have Denver Service Center, you have the regions, you have the individual parks. Are they coordinating with HABS with all these drawings they're collecting? Uh, the other thing is uh, today historic structure reports are very important in the documentation of a building and if there's some way they could be uh, assembled and uh, made available you know, through HABS or through another source. Oftentimes they're just uh, regarded as an, a necessity that you have to do uh, in order to get a grant, and they're not um, filed anywhere, but there's a tremendous amount of information, and it's a lot like the old photo data books and drawings and photographs. They pull together all the information on the building, and um, uh, I think it'd be good to collect those. Also, uh, my experience is that before there was a national register, an HABS uh, recording of a building was uh, an important part of the preservation process. And you could raise money, and I've seen it, for people to um, pay for the preparation of measure drawings or photographs. Today, not so much. If people have money, they're going to spend it on uh, uh, other things like legal fees to uh, help save a building. No, I, I agree. And you know, as I said, you know, with the Clinton Woods Project is a great model, but it also creates work for our office. Getting some of these organizations to, to do some of the legwork to do that, I think there's probably is a lot of um, stuff in the in the regions and parks and whatnot that never comes to the collection. Um, and, you know, some people and use our title block and never send it into the collection. And a lot of the, you know, the negotiation between the SHPOs and HABS is really done at the regional level. And, you know, unfortunately, they're overworked and they don't want to see those drawings come in. So many a lot of times, uh, you know, we don't get drawings because no one wants to do the work of getting money. So, I mean, and then we end up maybe copying the original drawings onto our model. But how do we encourage people to see the value in that and, 
and no too, it's also, it's like, if you have it in your drawer, in somewhere in your region, no one's going to see it. Like, it's not helping anybody, it's not adding to scholarship. <coughs> Taking that next step to get it into the collection, which was the intent to have this national database and to have it all in one place is just really important. I think we can probably double the collection on that. Everybody who's ever done something for apps to send it to. There's a lot of photos sitting in Peebles Island that are done to have their stamp. So there's a sitting there in drawers, I've seen. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that we started to do is um, rather than a line drawing of some of the things, like if they're sculptural, we're replacing that with just photogrammetric ortho images that are high resolution. Because we're not able to. The, Translating that into line work really doesn't do much. Um, you're not really providing any more information. And I've thought for a long time that we should be looking at, there's a lot of people collecting digital data, but um, it just remains digital. And possibly, I know like some of the slides that you show are like ortho plan views. And maybe if, and this wouldn't be for every site, but instead of uh, having going through that legwork of having to do, like if the only thing we're end up going to get is either nothing or some sort of ortho view of digital data, quite possibly for some structures, that's a pretty good compromise. So I, I don't think we've sat down and explored what can we get out of these data sets that's readable. But I think at the scale that we're producing drawings, it's quite possible to get quite a bit of information out of some of the sites that are being scanned out there, and then come up with some sort of template for people to use to submit that information to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good idea. One of the things I've been thinking about today is that um, our program puts a lot of emphasis on the measured drawing. And sometimes, and some photographs that go along with it, but those are the digital ones that we submit as part of field notes and, and not official HABS photos. And of recent, I've been reflecting on also the power that comes in the short form histories that we submit. And so I'm wondering about what the next level is for student competitions, I guess, but also just making sure that that component isn't lost because students can get you know, a couple of students per year can get excited about the line, line drawings and nerd out and join all of us in this room and loving, you know, getting the line weights just right and all of that stuff. But I really think most of the students and new preservationists are interested in the meaning or the, you know, sort of the story behind places. And that's a lot of what's um, drawing people to our profession. As we talk with prospective students, it's really shifted from even in you know, 10 years of teaching, it's really shifted from, I you know, fell in love with preservation because my grandma took me to historic sites, to, oh, there's this place in my community that's really important and no one knows about. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's, again, maybe this is just our program, but I'm hearing in a lot of places that there's really an interest in stories and meaning. And so I'm curious to know, it's not maybe, it's maybe not a suggestion <laughs> as much as I think one of the things our program will be thinking about is how to really center the short form histories um, along with the record drawings. Thinking about another piece of your question, you know, where are we going with this stuff? Um, I do think that we've been talking about the production side of it. But the user side of it, too, I think, has a whole lot of potential that hadn't really been tapped. Well, there, I don't know how many drawings you all now have in the collection, but you know, tens of thousands of them. And um, they're all new ways of mining data. And I think especially with AI that some of us have been talking about, there's, and, and, and your student had worked on some, there's got to be a way to leverage all this work to be able to do something more with it than we've you know, done so far. And, um, I think that that's going to come fast, and it'd be nice for Tabs and us to be prepared. 
Well, Justin was telling me, and I never knew about this, he, he says, I, I'm the guy up late at night who links these things to Wikipedia articles. Huh? You know, well, think if you had teams of people who did that. Yeah, right. I mean, because uh, if you look at Wikipedia articles, a uh, huge proportion of the images that are attached come from the Library of Congress yeah, website right. because they're public domain. It's yeah. often hard to find a public domain image yeah. huh. of whatever subject it is. And so um, in a, these enhanced blog or, or Wikipedia articles, and maybe even more, it would have uh, authors include images that come from Hab's Hair House that are available. But I had a, you know, the digital photographs that come as f field notes, do, do they get printed out and do they come into the Library of Congress collection or do they go to National Archives because they're digital? I have students turn them in printed to me, and actually now that I'm saying it, I don't think I ever send those binders to you. I think I just send you the field note drawing, so maybe you guys don't see our digital photos. Well, we want them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so where should they go? Hmm? What, well, what's... even if you have to be printed out and copied, yes. and they can, you can send them as field notes or regular, but it's better to send them as an official Habs photograph, because then it gets into the data, the image gets into the database. So that's always better. So send a send a print, you know, and it doesn't have to be everything. You know, pick out the few that you think are absolutely critical. If that's, if it's, because sometimes it's a money issue or, or, or it's always a time, everything is always a time issue. <laughs> Contact sheet. Uh, a contact sheet. Thank so. you, contact sheet. So you need to do that. It's not hard to do. So, yeah. um, but again, you know, I've got another question here about how, how do we broaden public interest, knowledge, and support as um, you know, and, and that is and that is true. You know, one of the ways we've been thinking about we need to do a better job of index, indexing our legacy data. Um, you know, so make it easier to query and find things in the collection in some way, but you know, maybe you have a couple of suggestions about where we do here. How do we help push public interest? If, I mean, if you could get bloggers to do that, I mean, the Library of Congress has blogs, but I know what it's like. It has to go through eight editors, and <laughs> <laughs> your supervisor approves it, and they said, well, look, I can't use that word. But <laughs> the, um, there's so many people out there who, who, who might be interested in doing a, ha a Habs or Hair of the Day blog. Um, I mean, because the material's fascinating. And it, I mean, there, I think there's so many people interested in all the special interest groups like Railroadiana or Porches or um, Bricks. <laughs> so there, I think there's absolutely unlimited a a potential because it's public domain material. They can use it however they want to. And they aren't limited in how they use it like the people in, or working in government agencies are. So you get there's much more likely to get a proliferation, a useful pro proliferation of this sort of thing uh, by, um, um, I don't know how you go about encouraging it and, or, or whom you connect to, but it just seems like it might be, a, I mean, what do you all think? Is that a good idea? Oh, I think it's a terrific idea. And I think that the Habs, who's ever doing the, 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 um, <clears throat> the social media for you guys, I assume that you get a lot of interest out of that. It looks like, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, don't you get a lot of feedback from that? Uh, I think we have a lot of fans that, that, are, um, that are very interested in our work. Every time I post something, it might be unrelated, but I always uh, bring it back to, you know, you can see more of these in the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, we had started the 
Facebook page in order to engage with youth years ago. And now, this past summer, we found out that none of the students that we hired are actually on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so we're, we're going to be opening up an Instagram account. And maybe that will help you know, with, with some of that. But You're I way behind. If you're on the, even Instagram, you're, you're supposed to be on TikTok or something, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> which I know you can't do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, I, I attended a meeting uh, last year in, in the Getty Center. Uh, the University of Kentucky had um, initiated this artificial intelligence initiative with the National Science Foundation of the U.S., and they got some funding. And I was impressed that uh, there, were, there was hardly any architect or uh, preser preservationist in that group. They were mostly archaeologists who wanted to use uh, artificial intelligence for different purposes, um, improving data, uh, sourcing data, um, searching, querying, etc. So I think that that's, that's a piece of science that actually universities can help perhaps a lot. You know, if you find some, some external funding from the National Science Foundation or anyone else to, how to see how to improve the, you know, the outreach of the collection. And I think open domain is really important, what you said about the, and actually, I was remember your images yesterday about you know, Hollywood using some haps drawings. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, well, maybe you can talk to Hollywood. <laughs> maybe they, they still want to use some of that uh, material. But it is, it's true, I did, I, I have downloaded images from the haps collection, but I didn't know they were you know, open, open access, you know, open public, whatever oh, yeah. the, the term is now. So now yeah. I'm going to use them even more. No. <laughs> so, and I think it's really important. It's only for America. <laughs> <laughs> I will use a, a VPN so I will <laughs> pretend to be in America. I read out that list of all those countries all. yesterday. And actually, <laughs> and he, that was not the lit whole list, or we'd no, still he be said, here. He said about, you said about 100 Canadians, I bet you that 90 were my hits. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 the, uh, those were unique users. Uh -huh. Ah, okay, so but from different computers. Hits. Okay. <laughs> my only other contribution for consideration is this notion that Habs, the Habs collection, in my mind, has sort of two big things going for it. One is that it's really compelling, a lot of components that are really compelling visually, and so when we're in this social media environment where people are going to sort of scroll and passively pan, et cetera. There's an enormous amount of content that if you're willing to just continuously serve it up, people are going to be very passively sort of enjoying, appreciating, receiving, probably moving through quickly. And so I wonder about a strategy that sort of pairs that like passive pretty, pretty, pretty with this can answer questions, right? So like several pretty things and then student who asks how tall are Charleston ceilings. Like, this is where you would go to find answers if you have this one specific inquiry. So how this collection can be answers to things you're wondering about the built environment, et cetera. And I mean, and I don't know if it's still true, but for years, it was pointed out to me that only the Library of Congress, National Park Service, and a few other th things in the whole federal government can accept private money. And that's still true. <laughs> and um, I had talked to Catherine about going to the Getty another way for all sorts of things, like to have uh, artificial intelligence read all the words in the Habs drawings. Because mm -hmm. it, one of the things in which the collection is so ill served by is subject indexing. Mm -hmm. And even I was telling for those photographs, the Arthur ha the Haskell Haskell did the photographs of uh, the house that was where the staircase was. But the date on it is on the photo mount that has never been transcribed, mm -hmm. all those early things. So they're not, they weren't on data sh sheets or anything like that. So that sort of data to retrieve. Well, I, I was involved from the beginning with um, the Art and Architecture Thesaurus Project, which actually started uh, um, at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Um, and I was involved because the subject 
headings in the prints and photographs division. I told someone else this. One of the first things I came in, well, what's the most popular subject that we have? Monticello. <laughs> well, what do we have on Monticello? Where, where there are, what collection has the best photograph? I found Monticello in 25 different collections, photographs of Monticello. <coughs> but the best <coughs> photographs were in the Farm Security Administration under suburban estates. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Talk about throwing a bottle into the sea. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> wow. And wow. Um, that's one of the things that inspired, because the Library of Congress subject headings, someone has to publish a book or do something on them for the, to create it. The Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus is done systematically. Mm -hmm. Yet there isn't a version of it with images. Almost every image for architecture they, I mean, every word, term that they have, you could find a public domain photograph in Hab's Hair House to illustrate it, which would make it so much richer. That could be a project you had with the Getty that might bring in other things. I mean, you've worked with them, you say, in, in some ways. The only thing, I've, well, I've worked with them in a few ways, but that, that project, which they still support, it's, and they're very proud of, might be a doorway. Yeah. That was a long answer. <laughs> Questions from now? Can we take it off of us? When you search for something on Google, you got a half result. Yeah, that doesn't happen. Yeah. It's 99% of the searches in the world, so unless you go to house and most people won't, they'll never see it. You don't know how it exists. Well, I found a lot when I was doing this uh, because the photo captions, the Habs photo captions are now. They, I came up with them with lots of search engines, took me right to a photograph in Hab's Hair House in the library. And I don't know if that's, it's, I have, that's never happened to me before. It was just in preparing this talk, so maybe it's a new thing somehow. Yeah. So some of the credits today, there were five learning units, only three were health, safety, welfare. Yeah. I tried really hard. <laughs> 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 I tried really hard. Thank you. 
for your efforts today. <laughs> the timing for making this idea work for 2026 is really good for the 250th anniversary of the country. This is what the AI can do. Yeah, make it a project, a dedicated time, proper time project. Is there a mic that we can? It's not on. I am a member. Wait a minute. <laughs> so you're getting various levels of my voice. Um, I, I am peripherally related to some of the work that you're doing because I set up a program to understand better Woodbine, New Jersey. And among the things that we did was to really document and look very closely at how the museum, or the, the synagogue, um, had been developed. The biggest synagogue in Woodbine had actually been developed, what it looked like, and what we needed to do to preserve it, and this is in the late 1800s. And I had to go to a number of people to try to figure out how to do this. What is my background? It is not architecture per se. I'm a psychologist, I'm an oral historian, and I am, and I had been, I don't know at that point, I had not yet been on the board of the local uh, Jewish Archive Center. But I was very concerned about how do we preserve what goes on in communities. And what I did is I had to find different people who could help me. And one of the people, and I'm just saying this because I'm here, I'm coming from another perspective. One of the people who was helpful to me was Hi Myers. Hi um, actually endorsed me as a member of the Athenaeum for the work I was also doing in the school system to promote how communities develop and what people look like and what other kinds of things we needed to understand. So I'm saying, is there a possibility that within larger communities there can be a representative who is available to answer questions and help in the preservation process? That each community, each larger city, or community that we know of, or even starting small, like in just Pennsylvania, we could develop something where people could come and ask questions. The way the documentation went from Woodbine, New Jersey, was that I hired an architect who actually drew the drawings that we needed in order to preserve, to preserve the memory of the synagogue, and then it would, the infrastructure was looked at. We looked at the whole community. I did a lot of reading. Um, the oral histories were extremely important, especially because I was asking questions about how you live, what kind of heat you use, what, the kinds of things that you need to know about infrastructure of just everyday life and what had happened before. So I'm asking, is there any way that we can get people who would be more available to act as um, helpers in, in doing something like this. So you're going out of maybe the comfort zone of just working with architects, but I think we could get more information if we had someone in each community of, of a large size who could really begin to field questions. I only bring this up because I hadn't thought about it, and it's not why I came here today, but I think it's important. I don't know how, as far as communities go, but certainly there are organizations in every state. I know for New Jersey, there's Preservation New Jersey, as well as the State Historic Preservation Office, who I would hope if you call them, they could direct you to individuals or someone on their staff who could guide you. In Philadelphia, we're probably somewhat spoiled because we have the Preservation Alliance, who basically acts as an advocate for buildings at risk that are in the city and the surrounding areas. But they can certainly, if you called them, 
I'm sure they could provide you name or names of individuals. Um, there's other, um, we'll say architectural, you know, there's society of, I mean, there's society of architectural historians, there's, um, you know, there are other organizations that I think can probably help. And I don't know whether Woodbine has a, um, a preservation ordinance and whether or not there's someone on the staff at the government level who sort of re acts as a preservation planner reviewer. So I know I am one of seven people who sit on an architectural committee for the city of Philadelphia which reports to the Historical Commission on what can be done to buildings that are listed or within a district in the city of Philadelphia. So I think there may be similar um, organizations in New Jersey, but I would start by reaching out to Preservation New Jersey. All right, but we need to know that, and it may not be known in the public area, and we may, there may be people who are willing to I'm just saying. Yeah, and I'm not sure, you know, other than somebody doing a blog or something like that, I'm not sure how, I mean, I know Preservation New Jersey does a lot of advocacy. I think you would have to, you know, you know, there's also the State Historic Preservation Office in New Jersey that covers everything throughout the state. Yes, you're going to need to know to call them, but I would hope that there's a brochure or something at the county offices or city offices that would help direct you to those types of organizations. Um, I don't know whether anybody in the audience <coughs> has anything else to add to that. Well, that is Preservation New Jersey. That's Preservation New Jersey, the State Historic Preservation I mean, Office. This has all been done. Right. We have all the certification and the building of the building. And, and certainly, I think if you called the Athenaeum, they could probably, you know, or some public. So if you called your public library, I would hope that they would know of Preservation New Jersey and could help direct you. I just think it has to be some way. Yeah, unfortunately, there's no, I guess it's a question of you have to know. That's right. And, and I don't know how you educate the public to know, because you can educate the public today, and it's a different public tomorrow. And I don't know how that information gets transferred. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, you know, I'm sorry I can't really answer your question. Right. And we've done all that. Uh, and you're all right. But I'm just saying, we need better ways for actually the architecture to make very clear what we're doing and how. But, but I will also say, as an architect, I have to be very careful when I give advice or recommendations. I have this liability on my shoulder. And I have to be very cautious what I tell someone, how I tell someone, what I volunteer for, because I can, held, I can be held liable. Sure. So there's a balance between what one can do, what one can do as a volunteer, how one can help, how far you can go to try and help someone. Okay, and there's a huge Cape May preservation organization. So. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, uh, I, I think Ford gives me too much credit because I've only created the links for the hair collection. I'm just starting on half. Oh. A beginning is a beginning. <laughs> <laughs> the, the intent behind that was, uh, was to increase the stumble upon factor that, that someone who's first guess is Google or Wikipedia would eventually find the Habs Hair House collection. Um, but having looked at every hair record now, um, <laughs> which took a while, uh, I, there's a lot of Section 106 mitigation in it. 
And I've not heard that discussed so much during this symposium, and certainly because the 1966 Act didn't exist at the beginning of HAPS. Um, and I don't know how long it took after 66 before it started taking on that function, but uh, it kind of runs contrary to what Mario was saying about like the monumentally, monumentality of the documentation when something is preserved only through documentation and the artifact no longer exists. Um, could you just reflect on that maybe not being an original the contemplated function of the house collection to receive mitigation, but it's something that was added over time? Good. But, but you know, I think that um, what I wanted to say about that is that um, many of my colleagues, you know, I'm not talking about HAPS, they say that honestly, you know, just recording is safeguarding the object or the building. And I don't agree with that. I think that we have to preserve the building. Uh, and documentation contributes to that task, right? Now, if one site disappears because, you know, there has been an earthquake, uh, you know, a, a tornado, whatever happens, and it's been destroyed and the record exists, obviously in that particular case, it, it becomes a really important source of information in case the community or whoever wants to reconstruct or repair or do whatever. So I think that that's my emphasis. And I think that obviously the records of HAPS and many other institutions are really precious, right? Because they are kind of a policy of safeguarding that site in case of destruction. But what I want to say is that, I mean, documentation is just one part of this whole process of safeguarding the building, the, the build heritage. Okay? And we have to recognize that. It's only one portion. I mean. The, the matter of fact is that the conservation architect uh, is the one or, or the conservators are the one that prolong the life of the building and, and the people and the users, etc. So I, I, I don't know, that's what I meant about it. Yeah, I mean, mitigation has been sort of a difficult thing that we really need to get a better handle on. Our Division Chief Scott is has been Working to try to put some teeth in that, right? So, that will be the, that the follow up <laughs> seminar. <laughs> I've been involved in multiple projects where we have to do section one, the professional investigation and do documentation and also interpretation as part of it. And what's funny is I'm thinking, oh, sorry, I'm thinking about this now, and, and neither of those instances was there like a, a link or a QR code on the interpretive sign to take you to the HABs drawings that we did. So we're not even like linking it in the projects where it's done. And that seems like a, I don't know if anyone's had a project where actually make, not just sending it to HABs was part of the mitigation, but the wide dissemination of it was part of their section 106 mitigation. Um, I, have, I have a concept that I'm gonna throw out for, because I'm a, I'm a HAB photographer, and I'm, I'm one of the, what I like to call 20 old white guys who shoot four by five film still. <laughs> and so digital is coming, and, and one of the things that makes me nervous is that we, we are losing, or we have the potential to lose that gold standard or platinum standard of this really, really fine professional photography if we adopt a, a, a digital standard that is, cheaper and easier, but the cheaper and easier is super valuable. And so I'm wondering if there would ever be a, a place where we could adopt a HABs level four again, which is that simple little three by five card, which becomes the level of photo documentation that can be done at a high standard, but not at the highest standard. And so that you can, you can document a district like a downtown, you can document it without perspective correction. And the Library of Congress can now digitize and archive those images, but it does allow a certain level of documentation that isn't absolutely platinum or gold standard. And my worry is, in, like in California, the HABs documentation levels has, has trickled down to California. So in California, I'm constantly photographing buildings, some of which make it to the HABs library and some of which don't, in large format film because there's this trickle down adoption of that 
gold standard. And if we make a digital standard that isn't high, we end up with that's just going to trickle down. And, and if it's not very well spelled out, people are going to be documenting things on their phones. Um, so maybe we get ahead of it by saying there is a standard for students and for people who don't have very expensive cameras that is still accepted and now can go into the, the catalog and you know be something better than field notes. Anyway, it's a it's a, a concept of another level, <clears throat> a, an additional. I would argue that you, I mean, I see sort of a balance in there, but maybe a different balance. And that is, I think you need that gold standard, but I don't think you have to have a large format camera with the scanning back on it. And it has to be more accessible. But I think pr perspective correcting and high enough resolution that it's meaningful. But to be honest, you know, the you know, 42 megapixel full frame 35 millimeter cameras are producing images that have resolution that at least, I mean, I'm no scientist or expert, but the four by five stuff that I used to shoot, I don't think scanned is any better quality than this, uh, you know, the sort of high end um, DSLR. So I think, you know, in a, you know, instead of spending forty or fifty thousand dollars, if you spent ten or fifteen thousand dollars on equipment, you could produce stuff. But I think, you know, um, stuff's got to be perspective corrected. All the stuff that has is you know, developed over the years as the gold standard for doing it. You know, like you say, once you start dropping it, you're just going to be missing out of that. Um, and I think that's one thing that, what, one thing that HABS did in the Library of Congress when they were developing, uh, in the Park Service, you know, with um, Ansel Adams' work and stuff like that, really de developed archival standards and way of thinking about how to shoot buildings and landscapes that um, not only inform this small little piece of our world, but I think photographers all over do, shooting all different kinds of stuff really benefited from that. And I think that's where HABS has a role again is to, in the Library of Congress is developing these stand, archival standards, you know, what's, you know, you know who's no, who knows what's going to happen when TIFFs become obsolete, but whatever the standards are for saving the stuff and, um, you know, resolutions and that kind of stuff and how to storm, I, I think they need to be in the thick of it and meanwhile not lose the, the quality of the images that are being produced at the same time. Yeah. Isn't it a function of what HABS, its purpose has been and how it's evolved, is set up to just get architects back to work quickly and uh, then it uh, became apparent that this collection is uh, really important. Uh, then it evolves into a preservation function. And uh, at one point, I had a person in, who's, who's in Kathy's position tell me that they thought the major function of HABS was to provide illustrations for architectural historians writing books. <laughs> <laughs> and he really believed it. Uh, That's a good use. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, using large format cameras, you know, somebody like Servan Robinson would, each photograph would be a work of art. He'd do two a day, and Boucher comes along and he can do it much quicker. You know, he can do a dozen a day. Uh, but there's not many people with that kind of equipment anymore or uh, experience. And uh, I think that the idea of having a, a lower standard for um, certain things is really good because you might be uh, creating the only record of an important building. And it, because it's not perfect quality, uh, it doesn't get to the Library of Congress. And to put it in context, in the 30s, these guys were being hired because they drew. A lot of the photographs were taken by those architects. Mm -hmm. Now, they had to use a large format camera, but a lot of the photographs aren't that great. But they're the only photograph that survives of that building. And so they're gold. 
I mean, you know, the stories about Hab's architects developing in sinks in boarding houses, <laughs> and you see, and you see a lot of those negatives were not pro the image was so good, but it wasn't developed properly. But still, it's there, and it's 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 in the archive, and it's been digitized, and people use it. Haskell's, in a way, the Haskell photograph I showed. Uh, was he? Was, I think he was a professional photographer because they were available in the. That was the. Yeah, I remember it was explained. I think Charlie explained it to me. In the urban areas, it was no problem for them to bring in a professional because they were out of work too, and it sort of fit. But anywhere there, like in, in the South, it was very hard to find a professional photographer. Um, that's one reason the Library of Congress did the Carnegie Survey because images didn't come in from copyright or anything for these areas, whereas other areas of the country were better uh, covered. So it's all a question of balance. But for, for buildings that are endangered, any image is better than no image. <laughs> Define, how would you define a professional photographer? And no one had an answer. Somebody who makes their living with photography, which was about as good as it got. And I'm not sure how you specify that if you're somebody who needs to photograph a building. Um, so that that becomes the, the question. It was it was uh, maybe more obvious in the 50s and 60s when the word professional photographer showed up in HAB circulars and was a requirement. And Nowhere did it say that you had to have this certain kind of equipment. You had to produce a 4 by 5 image, but that was the equipment that professionals had. Well, the, the better word at that time was commercial photography. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Which is just hard to define. So. Um, to get the line of suggestion, too, that for public outreach, you should maybe consider SH or media entries. And uh, I will say that we did, at one point, we started to give small grants to SAH for their Buildings in the United States series to take black and white photographs, um, to take uh, black and white photographs of buildings. But it was, it was getting hard. They couldn't, it was too costly. And now SAH has gone completely color. And I will say, I actually, my former HAPS colleague, Lisa Davidson, and I did do, we were invited to do the Archipedia of Maryland 100. So we did that, but we, and then we were invited to do the book. And that's when they changed. And we were going to use all these HAPS images for the book. And they decided, no black and white. <laughs> and we had to run out. We took <laughs> Justin and Jerob, and we went to try to do as many as we could. But may, I think maybe when we go over to digital, that might be a, a good thing to do to get um, you know, to do entries, but it is, sure but it is a lot of work. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Catherine, I mentioned the new book, maybe, because people might want to buy this book, that lost book. What's that? Oh, um, yeah, no, in um, City Lights. I'm, I tr so uh, there's a City Lights Press out of Chicago does photographic books. And they just came out with a book um, based on the Habs collection. What they did is they selected 100 sites that no longer exist. Um, and so they have the photographs of them. But what they've done is it sort of came up in, in this discussion about taking the raw data from Habs and you know telling the story. So what they did is they sort of traced these buildings to their end, you know, from their glory days to you know, what they became and how they were lost. And it, it's a great giving voice to the buildings, as we've talked about. So it, it's a thank you for mentioning that. But um, Lost, Lost in America is the name of the book, if people are interested. It's a great way to use the Habs collection. Because it is a lot of raw data. And you know, we've, we've been thinking about ways to do that. Chad Randall, our new historian, had suggested maybe we do short, like, thousand-word essays on given topics with links to sites that you can explore then in the HAPS collection. So, I mean, maybe that's something we, we could do, too, to, like, sort of get people thinking about, oh, right, I can concrete. I'm interested in concrete. Let me, you know, because it's not always easy to find those things, too. So maybe if we, we do that and have it on our website, that would maybe be another way, too.
uh, say here here to the uh, uh, thank you to the guests uh, as well as all of the the folks that have been uh, working on the, or, on the organization of this project uh, well for well over a year now and uh, now now we have a good base for Habs 100 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Peterson 50 um, so uh, uh, we will be in touch with you in terms of when uh, when the uh, the video will be available online. And I, given this most important note, was that we have too many pastries. Please pick some up on your uh, uh, on, on, on your way out. Uh, and I will ask that if there are students here, I would like to meet all of the students in the gallery before you leave. Uh, so you're not in trouble. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right.